American swimming was knocked back on its heels in March when the coronavirus lockdown kicked in. High school seasons were cut short, NCAA Division II and Division I championship meets were canceled, and things weren't looking very solid for U.S. Olympic trials, or maybe even the Olympics. Swimming World Magazine reported it this way. The NCAA cancellation was one of many this day, which included the cancellation of the Danish Open and Olympic trials, FINA postponements and cancellations, the cancellation of French Junior Championships, and a plea from Italy to halt the Olympic Games to avoid Tokyo 2020 going ahead in July when many of the world's best swimmers may no longer be in the kind of shape they would have been but for the pandemic and its effects. After struggling for months to figure out how to resume training this summer, one more shocker was announced this past week. We'll discuss it and a lot more in this week's episode of Swim Talk. Stay tuned. The comments and opinions of the hosts and guests are their own and do not reflect those of their employers, friends, families, or casual acquaintances. Hello and welcome to Swim Talk A to B, everything you need to know about swimming from A to B and anything else we want to talk about. I'm Dana Abbott, the A, and joining us from Bay City, Texas, is the show's co-host, Bob Button, who is the B in A2B. Bob, how's it going today? Never better. The swimming world got a bombshell dropped on it this week when Arizona State announced it was going to forego competition and redshirt everybody on their team for this coming year. No competition, just training. For that program, that's probably the best course of action. I I would say we may see some dominoes fall. It's going to depend on a lot of factors. School size is one. Some of these bigger programs with a lot of kids qualified already for trials or able to qualify for trials they may feel like Coach Bowman and say, you know, they pulled the rug out from our kids once. I'm not going to let them pull it out from under them again. We're going to just shoot for long course trials. A program that might not have a whole lot of financial health it might be tough for them to go a whole year red shirting and justify that. The programs that don't have a whole lot of kids with a chance to qualify for trials or even for NCAAs, they probably want to swim. Of course, that'll be up to their conference. I'm I'm thinking maybe if several bail out, there goes their conference meet. Some of these schools, if they wanted to get ready for long course trials, they may not have the facility available, may not have the competitions available to qualify if they haven't already because they lost this summer where a lot of kids were going to go home, get their trial cuts and go to trials next year. Uh, It's going to be interesting to see how many programs follow suit. The interesting thing is that we've got a guest on this week's podcast who is not only a coach, but is a parent of a swimmer on that Arizona State program. We're going to hear from him in just a minute. Our guest on this episode of Swim Talk is past president of the Texas Interscholastic Swimming Coaches Association, a two-time Texas State High School Swimming Coach of the Year, and comes from one of the most storied swimming families in Texas. Patrick Henry spent four years as head coach at Burnett High School, ten years at Grapevine Colleyville, seven years at Capel, and last year retired after five years as head coach at Belton High School. We'll hear some stories and news from Coach Patrick Henry right after this. Stay tuned. If you're a high school coach, you should be a member of NISCA, the National Interscholastic Swimming Coaches Association. Membership benefits include a bi-monthly journal, a $1 million liability insurance policy, numerous award programs for coaches and swimmers, including All-America Swimming, Diving, Water Polo, and Academic, and multiple resources for coaches' education. NISCA. Find it online at NISCA, N-I-S-C-A, online.org. That's NISCAonline.org.
Bob Button is joining us today with a special guest. Today we're talking with Patrick Henry. Thanks for joining us today, Coach Henry. Coach Button, Coach Abbott. Hey, I wanted to start off with you giving everybody a rundown on the on the Henrys, the swimmingest family around. Tell us all about y'all. All right. I don't know if we're the swimmingest, but we, we, we dabble with it a bit. Uh, my older brother swam at Texas. Uh, he, he was on Eddie's first national championship team in 81. My wife swam at Texas. She was on two national championship teams with Bergen in 81 and 82. My little brother swam at Texas. He was on the first time they won four in a row. He was on the first three. He's now the head men and women's coach at Yale. My older son swam at Texas. He was on three national championship teams. My daughter swam at Southern Illinois for Rick Walker, who's getting a big uh, Lifetime Achievement Award this, this year from College Swim Coach Association. She has a semester to go, and then my youngest son swims at Arizona State for Bob Bowman. Very I good. And, uh, I and, swim and and you, <laughs> I keep stepping on you. You're an Aggie. That's right. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, speaking of Noah, uh, out at Arizona State, ASU dropped a bombshell on the swimming world yesterday. And I wonder if you could tell us what you what you can about that. Yeah, it was um, it was kind of different. We we did not see this coming. We got notification that all the parents and swimmers were invited to a big Zoom meeting with Bob and Rachel and uh, some of the administration. Bob just came right out and said it. You know, <laughs> here's what we're. You know, he said, uh, Bray Anderson, who's the incredible athletic director out there, said, you know, I challenge all you coaches to find a way to come out of this COVID thing better than when you went in. And so looking at it, Bob said, because we don't know if the conference meet is going to be held or if NCAA is going to be held or if we're going on a travel meet and somebody gets a fever and we have to quarantine them and we're on a bus and how do you do that? And, and just there's so many unknowns at this moment. A lot moment. of variables, yeah. A lot of variables that can change. It's not like you can even get the variables and plan for those. The, the variables can change two weeks from now. And so right. he said, what we decided to do is we're going to just take a step back and redshirt the entire team and focus on, you know, we will have training we, and we'll focus on long course summer and Olympic trials and next school year. And everybody gets another year of eligibility. We want you to try to get, um, you know, multiple undergraduate degrees or work on a master's if that's your choice, but you've got that, you've got the flexibility, you've got the option. If you're in a good training position at home, stay at home and do your classes online. We'll work things out as we need to. We're kind of feeling as we go, but at least now we have something we can plan for. Pat, right. uh, based on what you've said, uh, when I heard about this, I just got the feeling, I, I think this is probably a real smart decision on Bowman's part, but it made me think that this is just going to be the first of all of the dominoes falling. What do you think? Uh, I talked to another Division One coach shortly afterwards, and he said that their school had been kind of toying with that idea since July 1st, but they weren't quite ready to pull the trigger, so to speak. It's, uh, it's a that, hard trigger to pull. It is. But now that Bob has done it, and like I said, Bob said, we talk to our compliance. We talk to our athletic department, our athletic director. We talk to our university president. And we talk to uh, some committee of PAC-12 of all the schools. And he said the, the PAC-12 group took literally about five seconds to pass it and say, yes, that's fine. We do it. Which might so, lead you to think that the rest of the PAC-12 is leaning that way also? I would think with some of the things that California, especially the University of California and all their schools has said consistently, you would think that that may be a very viable option that they may be looking at. Bob, like I said, Bob went ahead and pulled the trigger and said, I'll do it. We'll step out and be first and we're going to do it well. And at first it really blew me away. But as I got my arms wrapped around it and started thinking about the ramifications and such, given the state that we're in right now of this crazy world and the misinformation and nobody knows and the numbers and yeah, I think it's a good idea. If you love grape candy, and hey, who doesn't? Stop in at Arbor Hill Winery in scenic Naples, New York. They have everything grape and more. Grape gummy bears, grape gummy fish, grape twists. Heck, there's even grape saltwater taffy. Warrants in Ontario County? No problem. Order online at thegrapery.com.
It's, it's, it's amazing that when I think about ASU and you think about years ago when uh, athletic director Lisa Love wanted to drop the sport, how yeah. far you've come to where we could take a year redshirting the whole team and still be a solid, strong program. I'm, I'm just amazed at what they've done out at ASU to not only keep the program alive, to, but to strengthen it so much. They really have done a good job of uh, recruiting well. And the support from Ray Anderson is phenomenal. What this basically is going to do is that the next year, they're basically going to have five classes. That was my next question, because when NCAAs was uh, canceled this spring, and they were talking about, you know, what, what can we do for these seniors? You know, can we give them an extra year of eligibility and then the, then the question that followed that was, okay, well, if you do that and then you've got an incoming class, you've got five classes. How does that affect scholarship limits? How does it affect the spots you've got on your championship team? How does it affect who's going to redshirt and who's not? What are your thoughts on that? Well, Bob explained that. I, I thought his, his uh, answer was, in this situation, probably <clears throat> the best answer available. And basically... Uh, what he said was, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, they, they lost their diving coach earlier this year. And so he said, <clears throat> for the short term, we're going to use those diving scholarships that we allocate to pay for our fifth year seniors and not have diving for the short term. That's that's a great idea for people that aren't that big on diving. <laughs> uh, that's 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 really thinking outside the box. It's exactly. not going to help someone like Texas though that depends on its divers. No, absolutely not. It, not everybody can do it. But Arizona State was in the position, the, the unique position of the way that the numbers played out. That um, it works out. Now the reality of it is. Arizona State has two senior guys this year, so it's not like it's a huge class. Okay. Now, where it's going to be more of a factor is next year, Noah's class, because that is a very large class and right. a lot of scholarship money allocated for that, more than it could be made up just with the diving, I would think. And on that, what his, his reply was, was basically when they get to the fifth year, we will look at it and... It will be allocated based on performances and such. And, and it, you may not get the entire scholarship that you've gotten up till now, but you'll get, you know, you will be on scholarship and you will get your fifth year. I'm going to move on a little bit. That's good info. Uh, Bowman's one of the coaches uh, uh, that I'm thinking of here. Coaches are coming out against early specialization. Folks are learning that being sports-specific athlete at a young age isn't such a great thing. Uh, give us your take both as a parent and a coach on that well as a parent i come from a somewhat of an athletic family you know my dad played basketball at a&m i had an uncle who played football uh, at texas a&m and then played in the nfl for a while and so we've just always fairly been athletic as part of what we do we did multiple sports you know i'm one of seven children 10 years between the oldest and the youngest and we did all sorts of different sports and then but my brother my older brother and i kept getting hurt playing football i had a hip injury he broke his arm and so there was a group that was starting in this is out in uh, goche mississippi dana you know where i'm talking about <laughs> I, we were going to talk about that later but go ahead <laughs> And, uh, at the country club there, they were starting a, a, a swim team. And my mom said, you know what? We're joining. That way I bring everybody, I drop them off and I pick them up and I'm not running all over a taxi service, all there over dropping go. someone off at baseball, someone off at softball, somebody off at soccer. I'm doing one and back. And uh, we swam for Chris Wainwright and that's how we started. And, and we were not very good, but it was a start. And so... We had done multiple sports and we're, we're good at multiple sports, basketball and football. But the way it worked out for our family and health wise, we all gravitated towards swimming. Now, as Eddie Reese will tell you, you don't pick swimming, swimming picks you. You know, you've got to have the mindset to be a swimmer. You can't just want to be a swimmer. It, you, you have to live it. And uh, we bought into it. Four of us ended up swimming in college at either A&M or Texas. I just I had a younger sister who swam with me at A&M. And so 
you know, swimming has been very good to us. So as a parent, I believe in putting the kids in multiple sports and letting them choose what they want to do. We put our kids in multiple sports and they all came up at one point or another and said, can I, can I just swim? You know, (laughs) you know, I wasn't going to say no. So, but they did try baseball, softball. We never did soccer, basketball. Um, We never did football uh, simply Actually, no, we did flag football. We never did contact football. But of all the things they tried, they liked swimming the best. And so they all stuck with it, and they all became state qualifiers in high school and <clears throat> Division One scholarship athletes, and it's been real good for us. As a coach, with the younger kids, I don't – think it's a bad thing at all to do multiple sports. In fact, I love to get gymnasts into swimming because they have such muscle control and strength, even at a young age. But in the younger kids, yes, multiple sports, no problem. There does come a point, and it's a different point with every person, on when they need to decide if that's what they're going to do, then they need to put the time in and commit to it. You can't, you guys know as well as I do, if you look at the top swimmers at high school state in Texas, which is fast, I would dare to say, yes, there have been some exceptions of some non-club swimmers who have scored and done well, but the majority of the people who score points, big points, and win and do different things swim both club and high school. And it's an aerobic sport, it's an aerobic sport, and there's no substitute for time in the water. Absolutely. And now Noah was one of the later... Uh, additions to swim only, wasn't he? he? He wasn't all that interested in it when you were up in Grapevine, was he? Funny story about Noah. Noah was on the team and did other sports and stuff. And he just, but he was the kid who would uh, fit water people and play with his kickboards. And he had a little game he did with his kickboard and stuff. And Eddie Reese came by my practice one day to recruit my older son. And, uh, and Noah's in the water. You know, and I got probably 80 kids in the water. And I got Hayden in lane one, and Eddie's watching him swim, and I'm giving him a set, and, Ed, and he's turning it up, and Eddie's going up. His underwaters are great. You know, he's technically oriented. It's, it's perfect. And he, he goes, but I got one question for you. he had been there for about an hour. And I said, okay, Ed, what? He goes, who's that kid right over there? I said, Eddie, out of 80 kids I've got in the water, you just picked out my other son. And he turns to me and he says, you, you know he's going to be great. I said, Eddie, he's the beastie swimmer right now. And look at him. He plays around. He goes, yeah, look at him. He plays around kicking underwater faster than anybody on your team, and he's just playing. Look right. at his breath. Look at how he catches the water and does things with it that people just I can he goes, I can't teach that. I've tried. I can't teach that. But he's got that catch where he grabs the water. He's not fast today, but he's going to be. And so I went to Noah and I said, Okay, Noah. You're a beast. He's going to you kill him. I said, I'm the head coach. I go to A meets with Hayden. I go to double B meets with Savannah. And I, I don't have to go to B, C meets, but I go because you go to B, C meets. I said, I don't believe in paying swimmers, but I'll give you 10 bucks if you make double B times. <laughs> 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 double B meet and he makes all, or double B, C meet makes all double B times. I said, great. And then he goes to his first double B meet and he makes all A times. I said, well, that's great. And, he goes to his first A meet, and it was the Bill Nixon big prelims finals meet in Rockwall. He makes the top eight in the 50 fly. And I'm like, no, that's great. You made top eight. He goes, well, wasn't I supposed to? And I go, yeah, 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 you're supposed to. It's fine. <laughs> and he didn't know the, the leaps. In, I mean, he went from BC to B, double B to A to scoring to tags to setting state records and winning tags to making sectionals to go into sectionals to making his junior cuts. He, he went to his first juniors. This is his first juniors, and in, in, uh, in the first day, he, he doesn't have an event. So I said, well, it's time trial the 200 fly. I said, I want you to go out. It's long course. So I want you to go out slow, smooth, build the second 50, go for it on the third 50 and keep your hips up and kick, get it home. And he goes out, and he just stinks. And he gets out, and he goes, oh, I, I, I don't do this strategy stuff very well at all. I didn't <laughs> Okay, okay. Tomorrow you're swimming the 200 backstroke. You're in heat one with two other people. Go out and get in the lead and don't let anybody pass you. Oh, I can do that. That sounds like button strategy. (laughs) So he goes out and he wins it and goes his best time. Now he's feeling good. So the next day he's up for the 100 fly. And I said, okay, you know the strategy. 
go out and get in the lead and don't let anybody pass you. <laughs> so he goes out and wins his heat big and throws down a 54, something ridiculous, not far from Olympic trial cuts, and ends up making the bonus heat. And I said, okay, we're going to go back to the hotel. When we come back, we're going to be here early. You're going to be one of the first ones to get in. You're going to get a good warm-up in before the pool gets crowded. You're going to get out. You're going to wait until they do dives. You're going to get back in. We're going to do a couple of dives. At this time, I'll meet you at the warm-up pool. We'll get into our warm-up and relax, listen to the cadence of the starter, get your game on, and let's get out there and have some fun. So I'm walking to the warm-up pool, and I see him walking, and he's kind of grinning. And I go, what's going on? He goes, I forgot my suit at the hotel. <laughs> That's <laughs> nice. That's not a problem. Go put your backup suit on. Well, I forgot that one at the hotel, too. I said, that, then that's not a backup suit. That's a hotel suit. We're in San Antonio. And I look at the highway, and it's bumper to bumper. To that. And I said, okay, look, borrow a suit from somebody. Warm yourself up and get behind blocks and do not miss your event. Because if you miss your event, you're out of the meet. I may be here. I mean, I'm going to jump in the, my truck. I'm going to run to the hotel. I'm going to get your suit. I'm going to be back here. Good luck. So I run to the hotel, get back. He's behind the blocks. He's got a borrowed suit on. He's, he's okay. I, and I said, you know, he's got about two, three heats before he swims. And I said, let's not stress it with this suit. you got a suit on. We'll just go with that. I hate for you to try to get this one on and rip it. These suits are hard. They take time. He said, okay, that's fine. That's fine. So he gets up there and swims, and he misses the Olympic trial cut by one one-hundredth of a second. Oh. I'm like, oh. So next day, he's got the backstroke again. He's in like deep five, lane one, does the same strategy, makes a bonus cut. This time, we could do everything the same, but he's got his suit with him, wins the console heat, makes his trial cut. All right. We go out to dinner afterwards, and he goes, you know, I didn't know how that suit drew me yesterday. I bet I could have made that fly cut. <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of other sports, but when he decided to get serious about his swimming, he, he had been in the team enough. He had a strong foundation. His underwater kicking was phenomenal. His breath control was great. And so we just played that card and used that to his advantage. and. He didn't know he, he literally didn't know he wasn't supposed to. Yeah, he had a feel for the water and uh, and uh, had a little bit of aerobic background enough to get through and and then you really can put the hammer down when he says he's committed. Pairing wine and food is easy. It's finding just the right whoopie pie to go with your moxie that's tough. Wicked Whoopie says just what you're looking for. They've got peanut butter chocolate chip, pumpkin, gingerbread, maple, and mint, just to name a few. Find your perfect combination at wickedwhoopies.com. Okay, we're back after that short break. Bob, what's our next question for Patrick? Well, I know Patrick retired recently, and, and I want him to talk to us about his newest venture. It's, it's, it's kind of a coach finder business, but it's more than that, right? Well, yes, it is. It's, uh, it's funny because I've been thinking about this for a while. Actually, believe it or not, I did a test run with you, Coach Button, um, <laughs> back up in the grapevine days. And, and what it is, is when a team in general loses a coach, whether it be through injury, retirement, taking another job, safe sport, whatever, they're in a bind. And you can't just stick a body in there. You have to have a certified USA member, blah, 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 all background checks, all the courses, the first aid, CPR, coach safety training, everything taken care of. And just to do that starting at zero takes a couple of weeks. And so I found myself shorthanded in Grapevine and, and you were not coaching club at the time. And I reached out to you and you came up and were a temporary coach with me for a while. Yep. Yep. Did a little Until coach uh, at a practice and a meet. I got thinking about that and kind of expanded that a bit to where I have a bunch of uh, coaches with 30 plus years experience who can come in on short notice and be a temporary coach somewhere so a club can keep the, the keep practices running, keep everything going legally. And while the board of directors or whoever the governing body of that, the hiring body is, can put together uh, an interview process and select a good coach. It kind of gives them breathing room in order to hire a good coach, not just the first certified coach who walks in off the deck. So that's right. the first, just a temporary coach who can just give breathing room to an organization with a quality coach. I mean, coaches who've been in this sport for 
you know, 30, 35 years and, and the names of some of my temporary coaches would blow you away. I mean, there's some real big names. That's the first part. And then the second part is, you know, because I've owned my own club team, I've worked for a board of directors, I've started teams, I've sold teams, I've bought teams, I've started a school district run team just recently, you know, and so I've got some experience with running a team. So we can get you know, some consulting on group organization, uh, move ups, uh, fundraising, getting more kids in the water, all sorts of different activities. I can list that if we want some consulting, I can come in and meet them on that. The third part is basically the headhunter part. I've got a database I've been working on. I'm partnering with the International Swimming Coaches Association, and they've helped me a lot with this. And we have a big uh, people, they kind of send them a link and they fill this form out in this questionnaire and they send it back and you go into the database so that when teams call and need a coach with these experiences or these, this much time coached to this level, whatever they want, you know, left-handed, right-handed, whatever <laughs> absolutely they want, I can narrow it down and send them two or three people and have them choose which one of them that they want to hire. It helps with the screening process. One of the people I'm working with, it's a female coach. And she said, you know, I hate having to hire a coach because I get underqualified people or a bunch of foreigners or a bunch of just weirdos, you know, and I got to not be able to get a visa or may not be able to get their coaching credentials, things like that. And I got to sort through it all before I can even interview anybody. And I said, well, let me sort through them and I'll send you quality candidates. And they were like, that's a no brainer. That's what I do. And then we're also doing uh, what we're going to be implementing is the, uh, it's like a, a newsletter slash insurance. It's a, a, a monthly newsletter designed towards educating board members on swimming, on nonprofit organizations, on running a club. Because a lot of the people on the boards are good people. Their kids swim. <clears throat> they don't know that much about swimming, but they're maybe good business people. This helps educate them on swimming stuff so that... What I found a lot of times with boards is that every decision and every vote they make is based on, well, how's that going to affect my kid? Right. My 10 and under. Right. And they've got to be able to get beyond that. And so it's that is the newsletter part. And then if they need our services, whatever they paid in for the previous 12 months, minus a hundred dollars is a credit towards our services. They get priority status with us and move to the front of the line. So they can do this. They pay a nominal monthly fee. They get this. It helps educate their, their board. And if they need us, boom, we're right there. Johnny on the spot. They're at the front of the line. Let's go. I like that. I like the educating the board part. Makes you think of the local school district where somebody runs for school board, gets on the school board, and has no idea what a school board does until they train them. And they do have to train a lot. These, these people on local school boards go through all that stuff. Again, not just how this is going to affect my child. It's going to be everybody's child. That's good. That's real good. How is the business progressing? Well, you know, it was really doing well. <clears throat> until <And> I had... <laughs> I was about to sign my first contract for a headhunter position. And that was going to be on a Tuesday and Monday, the world stopped and it kind of fell apart. And so for a couple of weeks, I was a little bit bummed. And then I started seeing all these coaches who were being laid off and furloughed and whatever else you want to call it and started contacting some of them, getting them in my database and saying, Hey, when this thing turns, let me help you. Cause also another part of what we do is, um, I can go in and negotiate contracts for you. I decided I needed more experience with that. So I took a uh, online certification course on contract mastery from uh, the Harbor Business School and uh, got certified from them on contract mastery, just working on your negotiations and, you know, different strategies on negotiations. And it, it's, it's actually been a very, very eye-opening class. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Good deal. Hey, uh, now we hear this all the time. There's Here comes a cliche. Now more than ever. All right. Now more than ever. Okay. We get into this virus, this pandemic, and uh, it's it's stressing people, especially in our sport. We're control freaks. Quite a few of us are, and we don't have control. 
So uh, here's, here's a not so fun topic, but we should address it. Over the years, all three of us have known several coaches who took their own lives. We're not mental health experts, and we don't pretend to be, but there's got to be something we can do for coaches that are in distress. Any ideas? Yes. I'm in the process of doing some research and putting something together, a group of us guys who've been around the block a couple of times, and we've had highs and we've had lows, and we've had financial highs, we've had financial lows, and we've had marriage highs and marriage lows and family stuff and school stuff and job stuff. And not that we know everything and not that we're experts by any other imagination. That's not what we're saying. But just to open up doors and say, if you just need to talk to somebody, we're not a suicide hotline. That's not what I'm looking at. Mm -hmm. I'm just, here's some people that have been through a lot. And if you just need someone to talk to, whether it be in a mentor status or questions or whatever, we're here for you 24 seven. That will be coming out in the next couple of months. I'm kind of waiting to see how this, all this COVID stuff goes. I just listened to something today. In fact, when y'all were calling and they were talking about with the stay at home and everything, the suicide hotline is up 600%. Oh, the they're blowing up. Domestic violence and all these things going on and the added stress that everybody's under. So yes, I think that there's a definite need for it. No, I'm no expert of any sorts, but if somebody needs to talk, I'll listen. You know, people like yourself and Coach Abbott would be phenomenal at this because like you said, we've been around the block. We know a lot. We know we don't know a lot, but we've taken a few kicks in the teeth. (laughs) Yeah. And we're here for people because again, to quote Eddie Reese, it's how you can give back that means things in the world, not what you take or what you make. But it's how you can give back. And I'm ready, willing, and available to set the works company to give back. All right. For more than 50 years, seven time USA Olympic coach Eddie Reese has mentored college men in life and swimming, resulting in 14 NCAA team titles at the University of Texas and 39 Olympic gold medals. His life and his coaching experience is summarized in an excellent fashion in the new book, Eddie Reese, Coaching Swimming, Teaching Life, by authors Chuck Warner and Dana Abbott. Bill Sweetenham, Australian Olympic coach, says, Eddie Reese, no person a better coach and no coach a better person. This book says it all. A master class from a true genius in our sporting world. The book, Eddie Reese, Coaching, Swimming, Teaching Life, is available on Amazon.com and also from the website eddiereesebook.com. Get your copy today. This segment is brought to you by Moxie Soda. Folks in Maine have enjoyed the distinctively different taste of Moxie for generations. Be a maniac and shout, make mine a Moxie. Yeah, you talk about that distinctive taste. I'll tell you, if if you're missing the taste of chloroseptic in your medicine cabinet, you go down to the little local store and see if you can order some Moxie and you will not be disappointed. (laughs) Okay, Dana. I'm going to throw one more thing in here at Pat, and then I'll, then I'll let you go. Do you have any favorite sets or drills you want to share with us? Anything that uh, that's a real go-to that you like? Yeah. Only a dozen or 20 or so. <laughs> you know, I've been working a lot, especially with Noah. I actually learned a lot from Noah on underwater kicking and technical stuff along those lines. And I've really got some drills. And we we were starting with our novice kids and, and uh, teaching them that that's okay to kick underwater and putting fins on them a lot and doing a lot of stuff with fins. But I dotted a couple down. Uh, we do vertical kicking with fins, 10 seconds on, 20 seconds off. And you can do that every 30 seconds for five, 10 minutes, whatever. For 10 seconds, they kick vertical dolphin kick as fast as they can and count the kicks and try to get 30 kicks in in 10 seconds. So three and that's with second. or without fins. That's, with a, that's fins. a lot to get. Okay. That's that's moving. Any that's weight? Moving. Any, any, uh... No, because I focus on just, right now I'm looking at tempo. The tempo is what I'm after right now, not necessarily strength. Then we'll get a tempo trainer and put it in their caps, set it somewhere between 40 and 45. And when they kick off the wall, that's the rate. The beep, 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 beep that we want them kicking at. So they get that feel in their head. Now you swim sets sometimes with that in their head. Now there's so much stuff to do. Belugas where they they go underwater as fast as they can, streamline. And then at about mid-pool, 
they take a huge breaststroke pull as they're aiming up towards the surface and see how far and high they can shoot themselves out of the water and then come down and then just do a skull drill into the wall. We call those belugas and just see how high they can get up out of the water. And, and they start getting fancy because they're and they start playing. And when they start playing, they start learning more. But they'll Thrilling. do like they'll do belugas with a twist. Twist, belugas right? With, just goofy different things that they start adding on, and we can go with it. We do a thing called fried eggs, which are fast twenty fives. But you do a flip turn in the middle of the pool and come back to a finish. And you do a flip turn with no wall. It's fried eggs because it's like a fried egg. You flip it halfway through. But anyway. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> we don't do a lot of straight butterfly. We do what I call Cinco de Flyo, where they'll go five perfect strokes off the wall and then freestyle into the wall. Five perfect strokes off the wall, freestyle into the wall. We call it Cinco de Flyo because it teaches them if they're always doing fly exactly right, the bad fly becomes extinct. Now, there are times that they'll go uh, 25 or whole 50s, but for a lot of sets, we'll do sets and they're doing, give me five perfect strokes and two breaths. No more than two breaths. And then freestyle into the wall. We do some stuff we call DOD, Day of the Dolphin. Uh, it's for, it's an old George C. Scott movie from the set, kind of a B movie from the 70s about the Cold War. And they were training dolphins to have bombs tap, strapped on their head and to come up underneath Soviet ships and attach the bomb and swim them off. What we do is we get like a stroke maker paddle and put it on their head and have them swim with the stroke maker paddle unattached just on the top of their head. It keeps their eyes down. It keeps their hips up. It, it, if it falls off when you're breathing, then you're not breathing right. Then we do, you can't do breaststroke, but you can do butterfly, backstroke and freestyle with this. And it works on body position and angles and pitch and thinking about all those things while you're swimming or it falls off. Right. You know, uh, we like to do that with backstroke, but I prefer a hot cup of coffee to a stroke maker paddle. <laughs> uh -huh. We'll do some sets where we'll go, I call it Cinco Alo, Cinco Alo, Alo being all, all, you know, Cinco Fly, All Fly, Cinco Fly, All Fly. So Cinco Alo is what we do on those. We do an a and drill. I learned, we learned from Steve Bolton where you put a paddle on your right hand and a fin on your left foot and swim sets that way and then switch halfway through. You know, right. we do, we did a lot of ab work with wheels. We do wheels during warm up. do a 250, get out and do 25 wheels, do a 250, really activate the body. We do the stuff with the mini tramps on the walls. I heard John talking about that. Yeah. He, we, <laughs> we started that. But that's okay. Guess who just bought into it after you and Mike and uh, John all talked about it. And Bay city now has a mini tramp. It, it, it really does work. They get out of the water, they dive in, they swim to half pool, they do a surface dive. You have to teach them how to do a surface dive. They don't teach that red cross, red cross anymore. Surface dive to the bottom, do a flip turn on the bottom, push off streamline, dolphin kicking straight up, up and out of the water. And then they turn around and then they sprint into the wall and do a finish. And the next person does a relay start and does the exact same thing. So it's a start, it's a turn, it's a finish, and the red October is shooting up by the water. And they start doing this and they're, they're having a blast and they're not realizing they're working their butts off. They're sprinting hard. They're focusing on stuff and it works. That's great. You see something and you go, oh yeah, let's do this, you know, and we develop something. Or like I said, I, I learned a lot from my children as they do some of the drills and then they go, they go you know, if we did this instead of that, I think we'd get more out of it. I'm not afraid to learn from my children or my swimmers because they know more than I do. Pat, you want to give us the name of your new service that listeners could check in? I don't have a website just yet. We're working on one, but the name of the business is Swim Coach Staffing Solutions. And they can reach me at our email, which is swimcoachstaffingsolutions at yahoo.com. We'll try to add that to the YouTube. We'll put it on the description below so they can find that. That sounds great. I think that is something that's been needed for a long time and I commend you for it. Well, thank you. And I'm having fun with it. My job is I get on the internet and I contact a couple of people and talk to some teams and I talk to people like you guys and other coaches, friend of mine. And that's one of my job is, it's just connecting the dots and finding out who's looking for something and what they're looking for and what I can help them with. And it's so involved in swimming. And so all the contacts and all the people I've met over the decades, 37 years I've been doing this, I'm now able to use to give back. Again, it's about giving back and helping 
coaches find teams and teams find coaches. Because it used to be, you know, they put out a uh, an ad in Asca or USA Swimming and hope the right coach sees it. This is a little more proactive rather than reactive. It's It's got some real merit to it, and we're having fun with it. Appreciate you, Pat, because we just gave you almost no notice about this, and you came on and appreciate you spending this, this much time with us today. Thanks again. Anytime. We'll, we'll talk to you all. Let's go fishing. There we go. All right. And that's a wrap. You've been listening to Swim Talk, a chat with Patrick Henry. Join us next time on Swim Talk when we talk to NCAA Division I head men's and women's coach Katie Robinson of Northwestern University. Thanks for dropping by. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Swim Talk A2B. We'll see you next time.